All right, welcome again to Social Distillation, the submarine still of the internet, where we attempt to drop the bead and pour white lightning straight onto your brain. What are we talking about today, Samo? Well, as we have moved it to Wednesdays here in the States, Wheel of Time, last book. We are trudging through this, but there uh, there is a lot of switching around, which makes the mm-hmm. segments longer uh, when there's so much switching around because you have to address whole things. And we, we in the past, for those that have followed us from the beginning, tried to separate the storylines and do a full thing through and then a full thing through and that fell on its face. But actually, I'm thinking it's, it's too late to do it now, but Sanderson's style mm-hmm. might have played better to that. Because yeah. it's so bouncing around all over the place. It, it, especially here, I would say, in this kind of middle third that we're in. Once, you know, the, the setup, kind of the prologue, Act 1, is leading up to the last battle. Which, I, you know, the, the climax of Act 1 is the dragon's peace, really. And then the fighting starts. And, and that would be our, our Act 2. And and it it's definitely much more bouncing around, but they're up until the point where the three different battles, uh, of of uh the Borderlanders and the Aes Sedai and Elaine's army at the point where they all come together, they really don't connect. Mm-hmm. Um, so I mean, we kind of could have done that, but. Well, we'll continue there's to go just, chronologically because we don't want to mess something up that ain't broke. But, but also, it there's is, it is just so longer. much bouncing yeah. around; it would have it would have been hard to keep track of it all and the, the page skipping and all that. Yeah, so we're going to try to get through chapter twenty three today, and start up again yeah. on twenty four, which is starting up with Matt again. Uh, but actually, uh, I'm going to. We got comments, and I'm going to not go in chronologically, even though Scott's first. You were first, uh-huh. uh, but uh, we mentioned I mentioned this in the uh, the social episode we did last time. But now that we're specialized here, Isomorphic said that I uh, I only noticed the bad physics because I hate Gawain. And I address that there. It's no, no. I, it's something that does bother me uh, when I do read fantasy literature or watch fantasy movies, sci-fi movies, all of that. It's the old saying: when you when you understand physics, you hate action movies. Mm-hmm. So that, that goes for all genres that have to push that envelope. And I give a little lay, leeway because of you know art, but at the same time, it does bother me when the guy using a one a sword one handed that's not using used to using a sword one handed chops off the basically. A, what would be like our thigh would be a trollock arm in one mm-hmm. swing. And uh, as Isomophric says, you would be hacking for rec- reps, you know? <laughs> and uh, uh, so, so it's not my Gawain hate that did it. It just came out at the time. And in fact, I wanted to lead with that comment because I think I will surprise some people. This is my second reread of this one. The last time I did my full reread was the first time I read Memory of Light. Mm-hmm. So this is my second reread, and I don't hate Gawain as much as I remember in these chapters. Yes. Because I think this was actually good Gawain. Mm-hmm. This was Warder Gawain. He has a couple thoughts in his own mind that are simpy, but his actions don't follow those thoughts. Yeah. And, and so so we're, we'll get to some points where I was like, this, this was actually how Gawain, I think, should have been. And if I can't remember correctly, I hope it keeps going the rest of the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's the that's the one thing about reading something for the first time versus a reread. So this one is actually true to the titles of these. This is my reread of this mm-hmm. one for the first time. Yeah. All right. Okay. Where are we? The first one is Scott. How do you know the bull's eyes aren't Jordan? There were extant Jordan passages already written. That's the mystery question. I think one of the things we're trying to do now that we're so deep into this is parse out style. And there are some moments that you can tell is a different writing style. And I think that's where we're mostly attributing. That's that's definitely a pre-written Jordan moment. Whereas there, Sanderson has a, a very distinct style compared to Jordan. That is actually one of my thoughts here when we get to... Wh- the ending point where we're going to stop here towards the end of 23. I think a lot of that Rand section when he's headed up to Shalgul, I I think a lot of that is probably, if not fully written, 
a pretty significant notes or outline from Jordan because of some of the phrasing and because of how kind of spot on it is, but also because there's this there's this moment where it seems like there's a clear intended allegory of the boar as a black hole. Yeah, and I think some of these Gawain moments here, they they do come at me like there's a whole different style of writing there, mm. where the the pacing of the thought and the pacing of the the dialogue. It's not snarky and what, you know, we would have had more bickering between Egwene and Gawain, even though they're supposed to be being quiet. If it was Pierce Anderson here, I think. That's a good point. That's a good catch. Yeah. Yeah. The pacing. Yeah. That's a a good way to put it of of what you're looking at. Because you do have some moments where Egwene, before some of the major things happen, she's arguing with some of the other Aes Sedai and it is snarky and bickering and Swan and, and, uh, Brian is snarky and bickering like Sanderson writes, but then Gawain and Egwene weren't. And you say, no. well, it was just a situation, but Sanderson doesn't seem to care about that sometimes, you know, especially with internal dialogue. All right. Where'd you want to start? My first note is I think opening. Oh, do you the- want to go through the rest of the comments first? Oh yeah. Yeah. That- Sorry. Squirrel. Uh, okay, so next one in chronological order is isomorphic. Oh, this is a long one. I got a lot of thoughts. Sorry. Oop, so I have to hit the read more here. That's not your longest. Come on. You, you, you made me worry there. When you guys talked about Gallad, I realized how much it sucked that the White Cloaks in general, oh, I read this one before. It's a good one. In general, didn't have some RPG perk for fighting the shadow. <laughs> Like a strength of faith or something, fanaticism, but for the good, as the last battle is the fitting time for extremes. True, very true. Imagine Dark One somehow reaching out into the hearts of the troops in a crucial moment, and the white white cloaks through power of faith come through to save the day. I mean, it was somewhat satisfying that the white cloaks were just men when fighting the Trollocs for the first time in Towers of Midnight, but come on. The military unit that keeps their camp in perfect order, perfect shapes, and dress in all white can't be just men in the end. Everything about them is practical order as opposed to the metaphysical chaos of the dark one. San- Sanderson made them into glorified meat shields, which is that yes. is something yeah. I hadn't thought of. And I love that point that, yeah, it makes sense that the very first time they actually see Trollux, like, like even the Sanction, the ever victorious army, they got, you know, they got caught with their pants down the first time they faced Trollox, and it was a shock to them, too. But then that hardens you. It also, sadly, winnows out the weak. Well, so, and also he he used the word faith. Uh, th- did he use the word? Yeah, faith. Yeah. Strength of faith or something. So the first time is the shock. Uh-huh. But then the second time is this thing that was an idea in my head is real Mm -hmm. and we're the other side of that and i I think there's also a parallel here between what's going on in the black tower with Mm -hmm. turning and how strong you are in faith if you will or or in the core of your being then it's that much harder to turn you well likewise once once they've gotten over that shock what's left of the white cloak should be that hard core of you know, we won't break unless you shatter us. Yeah. And you could even have written in moments where you borrowed from modern religion, where there is a moment you could have even had an, in that first battle where at first everybody's routing because they just seen Trollox for the first time, mm-hmm. but they start doing like a catechism or something. They start chanting to oh, themselves yeah. and, you know, regain their muster a little bit. From like a like a just a, you know a, a battle version of a rosary or something, which rosary is a meditative practice. So you know a mm-hmm. battle version of that would have been pretty good. She, sea shanties and battle songs used to be a thing, partly for keeping you in time, partly for keeping you ordered and together, but also to lift your morale. Is well, there yeah. there was something. We it we referenced this movie together. a lot because it had so many good things about it. Saving Private Ryan, the sniper would go through the mm-hmm. low who go through the ba- uh, the valley of death. The yeah, according would, yeah. scripture to himself to yeah. to calm himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Um, oh, the quote on humility. I looked it up after the fact and re um, re requote it for me because I was there was so much we talked about that I humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Ah. That that quote is akin to something C.S. Lewis said, and you should go look up. I, I found a good article on it when I went to look up the quote. Rick Warren, who used to be a good pastor and now is, I don't know. But R Rick Warren in his multi-bestseller, A Purpose Driven Life, that's where that quote comes from. Um, but C.S. Lewis ha had an even better quote on it. And I don't know if Rick Warren was, you know, w was purposely taking inspiration from Lewis or not, uh, because I think it's from C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. And and what paraphrasing what he basically said is um, is not that a, that a humble man won't think less of himself. He just won't think of himself because he's just going to do is is paraphrasing what lewis actually said so yeah it, it's uh they're they're both the rick warren one is is very pithy but c.s lewis of course much deeper if you go and you look that up yeah and then on the flip side you've got the scientific part is we're all doing it for ourselves because altruism can be selfish everybody all the, a lot of people say oh well if we were all just you know chemicals and all this stuff then how does altruism exist well because altruism is actually good for you we're a social species you survive longer there you go the, the answer is easy so it's uh it, it's uh where are your values aligned with survival and the survival of the group and mm -hmm. and in this case we have the last battle so realistically one of the frustrating things that you know is all too human in these last chapters is how much infighting there is when you should have a common enemy. <laughs> and, you know, just the fact that he had to negotiate with the Shanshan. Yeah. You know, with, with, uh, with, uh, Fortuana, excuse me, we'll call her by her, her proper that, that's name. That's actually my note at the, at the beginning of chapter 21, when we go to the Aes Sedai who were at the black tower waiting to, to bond a shaman that, that Yeah. My first There's note a... on that chapter is like a tangenty one, but it's annoying. <laughs> uh, but okay, so okay, so the next one was uh, the one where he said my hate for Gawain, but he opened it with my comments on reality, how there was just the, the numbers got so big, and there's Trollocs mm -hmm. in this very resource sparse area that, as to his point, that I didn't say I should have. It, it, it was in my mind, but it didn't come out of my mouth that they're so massive and they eat so much too. So we're not thinking of of just the 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 number of them we're thinking of the number plus the magnitude added by their mass and then his point uh, that he uh, followed that with mm -hmm. was you the numbers on the human side have to be three to four times their numbers because yeah th these whole little charges to go through and almost no humans died but a bunch of trollocs did yeah these are seasoned soldiers used to fighting things these things but we get a good visual of this in book two when Loyal fights the Trolloc. Mm. The the we, one we, Trolloc in the in in Karhin, you mean? Yeah, and yeah. we just we just got a whole almost chapter on how fierce and strong in battle that the Ogier are, mm -hmm. and it was an even fight. Mm -hmm. And so Gallet is amazed at how the Ogier are fighting. That was an even fight one on one with that Trolloc, and so. So yeah, technology on our side, but they got axes and swords and stuff too. And this is where he said hack for reps. It's true. You, you're not, I would, I would, I give a pass for the power rot blades because there's something special about them. Yeah. But I don't give a pass for just a normal blade with a, even a swords master. Well, we also got to look that. You better be getting a good thrust that hits an aortic artery or something. Yeah. We also got a good look at it in book four, which why it's one of my favorite is the the numbers worked there because they were behind a defensive line they had uh, a makeshift you know wall and, and stakes and palisade to blunt the numbers so it it made sense that these farmers were outnumbered by these giant monsters because they had all these advantages on their side but once you get to a certain point you know to ideal's point about the suspension of disbelief 
when when you're outnumbered 10 to 1 and those 10 are each at least you know twice you know worth worth at least two soldiers at least you know or or to ideal's point maybe three or four when you talk about the tactics needed to take one down so now you're talking 20 to 1 mm-hmm. so it gets a little silly well it, and and i had this as a later note in the chapters but it was something that kind of bothered me from uh, several chapters ago when uh, Takima figured out the the weave for the, the, the horizontal gateway to spy mm-hmm. on the enemy. That would have been a good moment where all the channelers, the, or at least the Aes Sedai, could have come together and been like, how can we do a maximized area of effect spell, you know, spell nope. or weave on... on just a mass of Trollocs. And you, it, it would bombers. only work. It would right. have only worked once. But all you, if you coordinated that effort, yeah, all you would have needed was once because you could have taken out hundreds of thousands in one coordinated attack on one, every uh, front that was in question. A full circle with a Gwen leading with the with the saw on grill with with Vora saw on grill one thing. And you could yeah, have just nuked them. You could you could have. <laughs> so there's this funny anecdote from the korean war i think it was the the new jersey one of the last battleships we built one of the iowa class battleships and this uh this bad this north korean chinese battery near the coast on a hill fired at the new jersey and actually hit it it didn't do any damage but it pissed off the new jersey so that it unleashed a full broad, like multiple rounds from all nine guns, 16 inch guns, which are freaking huge. So much so that by the time she stopped firing, the hill had flattened. And one of her escorting destroyers flashed a signal with the signal lantern, flashed a signal at her, temper, temper. And yeah. You could absolutely do that with a full circle. You could flatten a hill. We've seen it done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So th- that just it was bothering me because they were, and again, Sanderson just overdoes. He does it here in a minute again. Mm-hmm. He overdoes the details of the battle because he's really he has a fantasy version in his head of battle. But he doesn't, I mean, it, it makes no sense, your explanation from Egwene's head of why everything had to be uncoordinated with the Aes Sedai, because they're doing this and this and this and this and this. I'm like, maybe if your troops were in there and you're trying to pinpoint where you should hit certain things, but that first assault was a full-out power barrage. Mm-hmm. Why was that not coordinated? Mm-hmm. You have people doing just random things, and a lot of them very inefficient. It, it is it's interesting and maybe someone who's smarter than me and more technically minded than me when it comes to writing and literature could figure this out but it's it's interesting that Jordan gave you fewer specific details and yet you understood the battle better mm-hmm. because he was able to describe things in such a way that it made it more real. And so you were better able to visualize it, even though a lot of times he was using figs and mice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Sanderson, I think one of the things he's trying to do here in these next chapters is show or or tell you what's going wrong with the great captains using this detail. But he actually did it okay in another part where all you know is this one offensive didn't work. You don't know anything else else about the, uh, the battle. You just know it didn't work. And why did Algomar send these people there? And everybody's confused. But now you're getting all these details and then hearing a little bit Brian going, oh, I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have done that. And it's mm-hmm. like, just say you did this thing that didn't work and leave a little to the imagination and you probably would have got a better product and a shorter book too. Mm-hmm. All right. What's the next comment? Pride is the opposite of shame, but yeah. it's not the opposite of shame, but it's source. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I love that. Love that oh. quote. Uh, if if you aren't familiar with him, ideals, go check out a channel called Master Samwise. I think it's master underscore Samwise. He's got some really good videos breaking down 
the characters of Avatar The Last Airbender. Uh, he also has some really good videos on God of War and what Kratos teaches us about masculinity. Um, so that's a lot of what he does is um, not just the stories and why the stories work, but why these themes are important. And speaking of themes that are important, um, the next one, uh, this one made me laugh. Well, at least the way he, okay, so uh, I was listening to Jesse Lee Peterson compliment uh, to a Jesse Lee Peterson com a compilation, compilation. And it struck compilation and it struck me how far ahead of his time rj was was the reason the dark one put bethamel's soul into a female body as aaron garb because bethamel was a beta male and i'm glad you spelled out beta male phonetically because then we don't have to argue with the british on beta male yes uh, but uh but yeah there was that but also the fact that he was a womanizer he was no he was mm -hmm. a known womanizer mm -hmm. so he was he was the sleazy professor he was the uh the sniffing girl's hair joe biden so uh, yeah, so there was both of those the the irony there, uh, but yeah, the the one of the problems is one of the themes of this last book that I see is it, he really wanted to be metaphysical in the final battle, and he was ahead of his time with that realm of knowledge as well, and I think Sanderson is is Sanderson's more of a fantasy writer, Jordan is more of a. I want to make my fantasy more realistic writer. And uh, that that kind of clashed in the end product. But yeah, like like we said in the, I think the first episode, uh, Jordan was writing trans before there was trans, right? <laughs> <laughs> Two souls, because yeah. it was actually about the soul. <laughs> it was actually about the soul. So it's... Uh, Way ahead of his time, yeah. <clears throat> Let's see... Another random thought, you guys. I was thinking of who the celebrities could naturally play Lanfear, and I thought Irina Shayk. Shayk? 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 Uh, I had to look her Supermodel, up. Supermodel, former girlfriend of Ronaldo. Okay, well, she's probably hot if she was Ronaldo's former girlfriend. Would be very close, not only due to her appearance, but attitude as well. She has that air of confident sexiness and elitism, accentuated by constant vocal fry somehow i think her personality is the same just a lust for power yeah that that's a tough one because yeah she probably would get the hotness down a little better mm -hmm. but if i look back at like maybe 90s i would have said somebody like shannon doherty because she does have that that borderline personality disorder kind of air about her when she played her roles mm -hmm. in, in like 90210 and stuff too so yeah, that's a tough one because you're looking for the hottest woman in the world. At the same time, you're looking for a very specific portrayal of a personality type. Mm -hmm. And that's 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 gonna be difficult. I yeah, I, I looked up this supermodel and she definitely does have that look of I am way out of your league and you know it. All of you, all of humanity, I am out of your league. Leave me alone. Uh, yeah, I'll look it up here in a second. But uh well, why don't you, uh, I have it to where you can share a flash the picture real quick. <sighs> Oh, wait, let me get it back up. Uh, Flashes. Uh, let me let me find a good one here that yeah, has while, the... while he's doing that, I will say that is in my mind when we talk about the show, which we'll do again when it comes back on and we're done with these books, that was one of the top castings they did. Mm -hmm. Even though you wouldn't call her the most beautiful woman in the world, they did a good enough job of doing her well enough that you would say she's beautiful. And she mm -hmm. actually pulled that part off very well you felt sorry for her when she was trying to make you feel sorry for her you felt the evil when she was trying to make you feel the her wrath so she she did a really good job it was probably i'd say top three of the castings in the show yeah and and i mean her her and ishi <clears throat> were the were the only bright spots really well and well, tam but you I, don't I, see I, I told often. you we talked about when we went over some of the episodes the guy who played rand was good when he was in scenes with her. Yeah. We made a meme on that. I made that meme that said, we're trying to be, be good actors and actresses. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. She so here definitely she, got the look. Here she is looking. But then I also like the, I will destroy you. I am so hot. I can melt you just by looking at you. Look yeah. there. That's also very land fury. Especially she, she when said, we get she into She says, I know, I know how connected your brains are to your loins at this moment. Mm -hmm. And yeah. 
Yeah. All right. Let me. What what was the meme? I'll have to look back at it. It was, it was we're, uh, we're we're trying to be good actors and actresses, but Moraine won't let us. It was something like that. <laughs> yeah, it was. I think it was. It was Landfear talking to Rand, and it's like I'm trying, but Moraine won't let me. <laughs> Yeah, something about we're uh, trying to make a good show, but Moraine won't let me. Something like that. Oh, I I actually have a note about the thanks again for ruining a good moment, you stupid show here at the the end. But let's let's get into chapter twenty. Was that the last comment? Off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. And my first uh my first comment my first note here is in like a whimper, because all right you've got this you've got this interesting scene here which. I, I think is to your point about he's giving us too much detail and yet the details don't matter and the details aren't, they don't make it feel real. Like the way Jordan was. Well, they you, very rarely add to the show, but they mm -hmm. all, uh, but they, but they also at times take away from it to the, to the book. So the times that they add to it are far less than the times to take yes. away from it. They don't take away every time. But like it, for it, it, for instance know. here in there's there were a couple of wait what moments and, and it it's compounded in the next chapter when you find out what happened to um to Sawan and Brian and how they and and Yukiri and how they were able to escape um you really lose all sense of time here um yeah <laughs> Yeah. Okay. For those just watching, I I found the meme that I had made, and it's yeah. uh, it's the Lanfear uh, Celine actress saying, "Follow my lead, and you could have some good acting moments." And Rand is standing next to her saying, "I want to, but Moraine won't let me." <laughs> mm -hmm. Um. You so it, it's it's a fairly decent action scene written by Sanderson here, but then you kind of get lost in those details and you lose a sense of time scale. So it seems like everything goes to hell like that. And yet in hindsight, when, when you, when you see later kind of the aftermath, then you realize, well, actually it took a little longer. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I, I think I get why he did it this way because it's from Egwene's perspective and he wants you to think, oh my gosh, they just entirely wiped out the Aes Sedai army and they really bloodied it. I mean, Brian later is estimating Gives that us the numbers, yeah. That Basically about a third of them. About a third of the Aes Sedai are killed and about half of his soldiers are killed. Mm -hmm. So they really get spanked. Um but th my biggest problem with it is, f well, finally, we have the big reveal of the Sharans. And this isn't all Sanderson. We've kind of griped about this, th that we feel like Jordan kind of dropped the ball a little bit here, that he could have just a few little bits here and there, just a couple more nuggets sprinkled in. Because really, all we get about the Sharans is you get a few references from the Aiel about what's mm -hmm. on the other side of the waste. And then you get that moment where Grendel is trying to distract Samael by talking about the Sharans. Well, and then there's there's also a realization I come to when we get to where Demandred pops up. I guess I'll just throw it in now. This second read through, there's a lot in the verbiage that tells you this is something he started at the breaking. He he set himself up to be the second coming savior of these people because their legend was he said i've been here from this i did this and i am this person he started I, that society yeah. he I have he's been grooming, grooming them for three thousand years it, it, it that we get some i don't think it was him it. you don't think it was him no it was ishi, ishi because he was only partially tracked because we know from things that ishi says as balls mm -hmm. that he at times was able to interact with the world more fully. And so he was the one, he was Hawkwing's advisor who turned him against the Aes Sedai. See, I kind of got a little bit of an impression and I'm, I'm, I am grasping at some straws, I will say, that this was something he was building during the war of power to have his own army. See, I don't think that's possible because of how destructive the breaking was. 
I don't I don't think it would be possible because there was no way he there's no way he could have set that up and then the odds of that society still existing. What I'm saying what I'm saying is he was building an army. The breaking happened and the remnants of that army had this philosophy based on him as an all powerful being. We'll see that, what I that suspect lasted for the rest of the time no, because they were isolated. We're getting a little ahead of ourselves, yeah. but it's just as well because this is really my only thought of um when I first read it, and I think I, I can't remember if I mentioned this while we were recording or not, or, or when, was when we were just talking about it, that um <clears throat> I took it as demanded taking advantage of something like the Quetzalcoatl myth and mm -hmm. Cortez. That that's the way I read it the first time, but it, but this yeah. time I'm actually thinking a more appropriate analogy might be Dune, where mm. the Bene Gesserits are crafting a prophecy that they intend to fulfill, that they intend to manipulate into fulfillment, and so now I'm thinking Ishi as Balzaman may have had a hand in crafting these prophecies of what are they called the uh the, the sharans the the wild bow the wild mm -hmm. uh as he's known i i think ishi may have had a hand in in pushing that and then when demandred was released he knew what to do to ha to manipulate that to be able to make uh because who is it who says you would think morden would be more on top of that though well, he was, I think, until they were released and then they were kind of allowed a, a degree of freedom because um, we also don't know exactly how long he was out of it when he was killed at the end of book three until he got Morden's body. Mm. And so we don't know how much the Forsake when we're running around unsupervised, if you will. Um, But I... I I, I lean more now towards is Shamael planted these seeds and then demanded with his charisma, with his leadership ability, plus with the power being able to do, being able to manipulate things that he was well, able to and, step in and say, I am, I am. And that ancient knowledge to make the power not look like the power. Yeah, that yeah. As he as he yeah. just shifts into the world here instead of coming through a gateway. Well, I I yeah. think that I suspect that's the true power. But he wasn't allowed to use it. I think and, at, at, and there Morden was a time where they down weren't. On that. There was a time where they weren't. But some of the things they're doing here, I think it's the true power. Unless he came from the world of dreams. Oh uh, yeah. I didn't think about that. That may be what's going on there. Because there's there's a similar scene here at the in the in chapter twenty three when Avienda is fighting who I assume is Grendel because she looks so ugly. Mm -hmm. And I thought she tr she gateway, she traveled using the true power, but I, I actually think you're right. I think she shifted to the world of dreams in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Well, if she's coming out from when she encountered Perrin, then she was in the world of dreams in flesh. The the, the um no, but she escapes Alvienda by shifting away somehow. Oh. The thing that made me think it was the true power, though, was Egwene's reaction when she's watching the way he come he comes into reality. Egwene feels like there's a wrongness there, like reality itself is warping, which is what made me think of the true power mm. that 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 would be the dark one breaking reality essentially to 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 bend it to to his will uh, yeah we we did get ahead of ourselves though but my first couple notes were things i already talked about was yeah they should have done the nukes too much detail uh and then finally the the last little bit here in this first section with goblin kind of taking control and saying no we need to hide out you know well, I'm going to rub some mud on your face and I'm going to cover you with my warder cloak and we are going to sit here until things calm down and we get a mm -hmm. a chance to escape his you know 
And Egwene is still being kind of bitchy, but it works because of the back and forth dynamic of, you know, she, I was going to say she's not wrong. She is wrong, but you understand where she's coming from. Mm -hmm. And so Gawain is more right that, no, no, this is, we need to do this. And you need to listen to me now because this is, this is my world here where you're, you're not leading an army of Aes Sedai anymore. This is this is what a warder is for. I did make a small note uh, about page back from that before the 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 shifting of the world and the, mm -hmm. the attack. This is again this is Egwene's uh, kind of ego and and she kind of proves herself wrong in her head, but she doesn't get it. Mm -hmm. She's reflecting on the seals being broken, and in her head she says, "Had had they broken them already." And she says, would the world even know if they had? I'm like, well, if the world wouldn't know, then you were wrong. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. I didn't catch that. Yeah. If, if you even yeah. have that thought, you you should have entertained the fact that maybe that isn't the end of the world at that moment. Mm -hmm. But you entertain that thought when you're worried about them. Well, if if that happened, you were wrong and everything's kind of good. Because now Rand can do his thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Which a couple pages later, I don't remember what the passage was, but I did write Egwene's narcissism at its best. I don't, I don't remember what that was in reference to. All right. Well, the next yeah. section is Avienda's point of view, which I like because I think Sanderson does a pretty good job of writing Avienda. Um, and to, to, I think you made the point a while ago. It's well, it's partly par probably due to the fact that Jordan didn't give us a lot of Avienda, so mm -hmm. we don't have as nearly the expectations that we do. With the main characters see uh, this is where I, I was complaining again in my own notes that there's too much stupid banter mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and so that's why I, I i think i still have a problem with avienda when she, when he writes her it's not the inner thoughts it's the fact that he's just can't help himself from trying to be funny yeah yeah um it, 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 the oh you know i hadn't thought about it but as you say that it's almost like in, in this silly banter here, it's almost like Iteralde is Bashir. Mm -hmm. That's who he's acting like. It's like, that's not in hindsight when we first meet him. And when we get him in, in knife of dreams from Jordan, where we see a, we see him for a fair bit. It's like, that's, that's really not who he is. He's a much more serious and um, polite, you know, person mm -hmm. uh and and it just well, dawned we, on we me. see that from their whole culture they have yeah. a certain decorum mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. almost i feel like it, in, in a mm -hmm. certain way um but actually the first thing that jumped out at me is right at the beginning here is i feel like rourke wearing the red headband of yeah that threw me on, off because it just comes out of nowhere that i feel like that should be a bigger deal and it comes out of nowhere and i don't think it ever goes anywhere i don't remember we, we should it. have had a progression to that point yeah th there are a number of things here at the very end where stuff comes out of nowhere people just drop like fly now some of the people just drop like flies jordan talked about that in one of his last interviews is that was on purpose he wanted that because as a combat veteran you don't you don't always get a goodbye. You don't always get a, a glorious death or, a, mm -hmm. you know, a, a dramatic, you know, you know, Hamlet giving a two page soliloquy as he's dying on stage. And it's sometimes it is sudden and it is shocking. But there's too much of it here at the end. It's so it, it takes away the shock. One, it takes away the shock value. And two, it is not it, it really isn't satisfying when it starts to be characters we've really become attached to. And it's like, wait, give me more. It's just, we haven't seen this guy in half a book and now he's dead. And same thing with the, with the red headband here. It's like, hold on a second. I feel like this should be a much bigger deal than it is. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I don't mind the dropping like fly flies as much. I think because I do like that raw reality that this is the last battle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, realistically if you're saving the world from the ultimate evil against the ultimate dark creatures that have been massing for for years into these unimaginable numbers and they're also three times as big as you so you need three of you to fight them if we didn't lose 75 percent of the starting cast 
is it even real, bro? You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the last thought I had on this, uh, I did like what Avienda says to Rand here when they, when they get together after the, the scouting. Um, so at the top of page 385 for me, it Rand is, says, I'm not certain I care what is proper this time, Avienda. A warrior must always consider Giotto, she said sternly. Have I taught you nothing? Um, and I go back if you haven't watched when I when I talked about the show Masters of the Air and I talked about this, that one of the reasons it was such a damn shame that the casualty rates were so high with the heavy bomber uh, fleets is. One, it probably wasn't necessary and those resources would have been put to much better use elsewhere. And two, it was kind of not right. You know, Arthur Harris, the head of Bomber Command, had what he called de-housing. And, and that was their euphemistic way of targeting civilians of, well, we're not really targeting civilians per se. We're blowing up their houses so that the enemy has this refugee crisis and it makes it harder for their workers to work you're you're killing men women and children dude you're killing civilians on purpose and you know it and that's take not remembering who you are and why you fight and why you're the good guys led you to wasting tens of thousands of lives and millions of dollars mm-hmm well, pre people use that propaganda all the time. Here recently, uh, recently, when the, uh, the 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 second Gulf War, we had, they used manipulation techniques to just not justify, but get people to be more comfortable with how they treated the prisoners of war. Because what they did was they used counterfactuals to say, well, it would have been worse under Saddam for these prisoners. And when you see that point of view first, then you're more readily accepting of bad treatment that's just not as bad you know so you can shift the overton window of what is right and what's wrong now well where i will give rand credit here though and this is an annoyance just like the not everybody cooperating annoyance her thoughts on guy shan putting off the white to go fight in the last battle it's called the last battle no giato isn't everything that's hubris Giotto is good. Giotto has its benefits. But in this situation, Giotto gets in the way of doing the right thing. See, I kind of liked that conflict in her mind because she is starting to accept that tradition for tradition's sake. That was the lesson she had to learn in the last book. Tradition for tradition's sake is silly. You need to remember and understand why that tradition exists but you don't just change overnight, kind of like Rand's thought of, you know, it's it's not suddenly better after he had the, you know, the moment with his dad and had the talk and had the sparring. But it is easier. He does feel like something has lifted off his shoulder, but you don't just change overnight. So I like that she's still having issues with some of this ingrained tradition mm -hmm. for tradition's sake. Oh, no, I wasn't saying it was a bad moment. I'm just saying mm -hmm. that I was just countering your point of the way people can justify things. and But sometimes you have to because the need is so great. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have any other thoughts on this chapter, did you? My next thought is with Myrel and Lyrel. And it was based on the names. Yeah. You put them side oh. to side. <laughs> Myrel and Lyrel, come on. Come on, Sanderson. Come yeah. on, Jordan. Whoever put that in there. That's that meme we have where there's like Sion, on CNA, Sue and C and Sue and C, and they all have the pretty much the same name. Yeah. But it's a yeah. one letter difference. Yep. So the, the opening of chapter 21 is Sawan and Brian. And their banter actually works. It's it's one of the few times the banter because it's not silly. It's it, it's actually serious. Their back and forth is actually serious. And I think he does a pretty good job of getting Sawan and Brian's character. Um, but this is what I was talking about, where when you get their perspective of the attack from of the Sharans on the on the Aes Sedai camp, you realize 
there was actually a fair amount of time that passed there that just completely gets lost in his description. Um, and then it it switches to and I messed up. It, you're curious. I said Takama earlier. I think. Uh, Speaking of names blending in your mind, it's yeah. Yukiri. Yeah, I think I said Takama yeah. earlier. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and then we switch to yeah. To your point, Lyra, uh, Lyral and Myral. Oive. I had to look up who Lyral was because I couldn't even remember um, that she was a blue sitter. Um, both before the schism and in Saladar. Mm -hmm. um, and my my comment here was uh, like the, the second page of this section in her thoughts, she's having this, she has this thought, opportunities appear during times of upheaval. Opportunities now lost to her, liked, but she hated that thought. It's chaos is a ladder is what she's saying there, you know? Um and so now we have to cancel Sanderson along with Jordan because they have the gall to point out that sometimes people are just people, no matter what they have between their legs. Mm -hmm. That uh, and, and even more so in this situation, because as you go, as you keep going and you get her internal thoughts on the Ashaman, the blue is even more misandrist than the reds. Mm hmm. And it's like, oh, it's almost like people are people, and sometimes they're just assholes. Yeah, I think this was on purpose, though, because this is the redemption. I think Pavara, Pavara is the redemption yeah. of the Red. Mm -hmm. And because we have Moiraine as our prominent blue, Lyral is that other side of it, the the, the yang to the yin, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so, so we got Pavara versus Elida in personality and we've got moiraine versus lyrel mm -hmm. as as kind of the two two sides of those coins yeah yeah it's i th i think you're right that one of the reasons she's there she is a sharp contrast to pavara mm -hmm. you know it, because it was set up uh, as her being the other blue sitter for so long ago uh i wonder if sanderson had that same moment going come on you put myrel and lyrel in the same notes <laughs> Actually, this oh, would man. this would have been a good place to because we get so much of her personality in books five and six is Lee Lane would have actually been good here instead of how she's used in this very same chapter where she basically just wiped off the face of the earth as one of you say dropping like a fly. No, that was where, Ramonda. Both of them, yeah. both of them get axed. Ramonda then Lee them. Lane back to back. Ramonda is haughty I, I and, and, lane. and starts to channel, but then yeah. Lelaine is one of the things, something she jumped into a tent and it was blown up or something. I must have missed that one. Yeah, that was another one of there they go. <laughs> yeah, but she would actually fit here too because we have more of her personality and she would have fit this personality. Because she, we already know she is very similar, yeah. Yeah, so we didn't have to have a new person come in as we complain about sometimes. No, I think you're thinking of Leanne when she gets captured by Demander. No, it was before that. It's like right after Romanda. Well, it wasn't Lelaine because according to the wiki, she's still alive. She oh. lives through the last battle. And who I'll, I'll find who it was. Let me find that spot. Okay, well, you yeah. have your next thoughts because mine anyway, is we see Demander um, again. So. Uh, where was I? Give me a second. Okay. Um I got a I got an eye appointment on Friday and so for the time being I'm going to have to look like an old man and um oh oh yeah and then the the last bit of this chapter I really like that it you know I I love that it's Androl and Pravara who show up to um to kind of tell Lyral what's what uh and the way they do it um you know, it's 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 a great moment of of people are gonna people, and it, it, there's a reason we have these these sayings of of wisdom passed down for generations. Like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. That's you know that that is a perfect illustration here of both Andrel and Pavara lead Lyral to the water, and then she takes a dump in it instead of taking a drink. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. But okay, then, it does just say she ducks away as all this stuff is happening and it never says what happens to her. Okay. 
Um, okay, I, I just read that the, the last night as if she was taken up in that tent being blown up. Okay, I thought that was Leanne. I didn't remember that being Lelaine, and I didn't even remember her being. Well, there. Leanne is later. She's the one that's pulled mm -hmm. away. So, yeah, I guess they both ducked into tents, and Leanne got fi uh, found. So, uh, last thought on this chapter for me is, I I like that we finally kind of get full circle something that has been been teased and talked about for half the series now basically since we first meet Cadswin, which would have was that lord of chaos when she first shows up i can't remember i think that's um, right yeah no because she shows up after he's captured so i think it it would have been crown of swords mm, um, yeah. or at least the first interaction well, technically we get her in new springs so oh yeah. Well, yeah but you know and then then she has that moment with um oh come on brain the cerulea of about teaching the dragon laughter and tears and finally it finally comes back around it, i'm i'm not wild about the way it happens but it cuz I, I i still feel like rand should have done something but it's explained well enough you see why either consciously or unconsciously as the will of the pattern, if you will, he wasn't. Is Because Pavara is having this thought of the dragon's not going to be here. They have to stand on their own. They, they have to learn how to live with themselves, how to rule themselves, if you will, without the dragon because he's done after the last battle. So you got to figure out what the Black Tower is after the last battle. So you better figure out how to manage yourselves without him. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that it is, it, it, he sends a message with this message. You know, he just sends a letter of his, a Andrew says on page 398 and, uh, uh, or it's actually 399. Um, <clears throat> the other reason I think that, that it works well is because it's set up and, and Andrew is just following up what he said to Lyra, which is these are men. And, uh, oh, no, it is 398. So it's when he's talking to Lyra. Uh, Here's the thing, Aes Sedai, Andril said. The Dragon Reborn sent, us a, sent a message to us just earlier today. He instructed us to learn one last lesson. That we're not to think of ourselves as weapons, but as men. Well, men have a choice in their fate, and weapons do not. Here are your men, Aes Sedai. Respect them. And as he said, you know, oh, I bet you gave us the weakest one. No, actually, we asked for volunteers. Mm -hmm. every one of these men volunteered to be here so you should respect that and as pavara says if you take the ones who want to be there you're going to end up with better warders because they want to be there mm -hmm. um and the the thought that jumped out at me when he said this of of what this matters and then and then in the last section he reiterates it to the to amarin and Candler and who's the other one there, Jonath, that um, I intend to follow this lesson. Um, he left us to escape on our own or to fail on our own is what Amarin says. And and then Andrew says, it doesn't matter. The Black Tower has learned to survive without him. Light, it has always survived without him. He barely had anything to do with us. It was Loghain who gave us hope. It is Loghain who will have my allegiance. Um, and then he said, I will take his last order to heart. I will not be merely a weapon. The taint is cleansed. We fight not to die, but to live. And the the one of the thoughts that jumped out at me when I was reading that is <clears throat> every once in a blue moon, you'll hear about a former special operator who, you know, gets up to some no good shenanigans. It is incredibly rare in the U.S. at least that that happens. But in other places, like, for instance, one of the reasons the Central American gangs are so horrible is because a lot of those guys are former special operators of their respective armies. Same thing with Russia. One of the reasons the Russian gangs are so bad 
and so dangerous is because a lot of those guys are former Spetsnaz. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a big cultural difference there versus here. And it shows in how those men conduct themselves that the, the, those men, they're just weapons. And so what does a weapon care if it, you know, brutalizes people so long as it gets the job done? Whereas, whereas our men are men and that's why they behave so much differently. Yeah, this sort of, if we, uh, I've got some inside information on some of the training techniques that make you a much better weapon, you know? Yo, 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 <laughs> yeah. Not that they aren't that too. <laughs> yeah. And so a lot of them psychological is my point. Not, not just you, you fight better and you shoot better mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you, you have great tactics. It's, Hold yourself on the bottom of this pool till you pass out and die, and we will revive you. Oh, here you go, do it again. You know, that way when it's you and jumping into a, a you know cartel tent with twenty guys, and you know you're not going to make it out, you still do the best you can. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, th there's a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's there is a lot of psychological, so that when it comes your time to be ingtar and block that alley. Mm -hmm. you don't hesitate yeah Not but i think it matters yeah. because everyone's just standing there and watching you and just shut up show but now that i think about it there is a cultural difference because if you attach different thoughts to why you're doing it you're going to there's a difference between someone who's not afraid to die and someone who is a weapon mm -hmm. so i mean yeah so Fair if point. you if yeah. you attach those different cultural uh i guess uh implicit biases that you we do uh, we do train our military as even though we don't use them this way all the time as a you are defending your country mm -hmm. <clears throat> not you are taking out the enemy kind of force and so we do spread that mentality even though we do use them as improperly yeah, but... yeah which is a damn shame i've mentioned it before but one of if not the best thing the history channel has ever done was a show that back in 2015 2016 called the war fighters and one of the reasons it was so good is because i usually despise dramatic reenactments because they're almost all terrible but these were actually shot very subtly so they're not over the top they're not melodramatic but then what's more important is they're used sparingly and most of the show is interviews with almost a hundred operators of rangers green berets uh uh air force pararescue marine recon and they tell their stories of iraq and afghanistan operations some of which went very badly and and one of them is a <clears throat> a green beret who was shot in the neck in an ambush and he met he managed to survive but he's now a quadriplegic and it you know, it is a gut punch to watch this man talk about it. And you can tell, you know, if you've, if you've ever seen someone who's a quadriplegic talk, they have trouble, you know, swallowing and things. And so you can tell, you know, this guy, this guy has trouble just doing the subconscious things we take for granted. And yet one of the last things he said is, I would do it all over again in a heartbeat, even knowing mm -hmm. how it ends up. He'd do it all over again in a heartbeat. Because he was there for his men. He was the senior guy. And so how many, you know, what, what's unsaid there is how many other Green Berets are alive today because he trained them, because he mm -hmm. taught them how to be better warriors. And so even knowing how it ends up, he would never take that away because that's what matters to him. There might be a selection process, too, because I was just thinking about it uh... It takes a little so, uh, sociopathy to be a very efficient killing machine, we should say, because you have to be able to detach yourself mm -hmm. from that to, uh, a little bit. But our recruiting process isn't that. Our recruiting process takes volunteers to do and creates the, the warrior out of them. Whereas these societies that you're talking about may pre-select for someone who's willing to do the job. Mm. They may say, you are this way. We've got the spot for you. Well, a lot of these so places much of are our stuff is, armies. Yeah. yeah. So much of our stuff is so voluntary 
that you will get more people that are like, I want to do this for my country. I want to do this for my family. I want to do this because of my skill set, I think I can make a difference here. Mm -hmm. And that's what volunteers do. Whereas if I'm a psychopath in the U S and I want to kill people, I don't need to join the military. I just become Dexter, you know, it's, <laughs> I, I had that choice to do that. So it's, it's, uh, so there might be a selection bias behind that too. All right. Well, that's all I've got on chapter 21. Did you have any other thoughts there? Uh, what did it end with Andrew? No, I did not. Okay. You, you covered what I uh, wanted to cover. All right. Let's pause for a second here. All right. So chapter 22, we've actually, um, pretty well talk this through from the very beginning because the the opening of this is back to Egwene and Gawain and this is where Bow the Wild shows up mm -hmm. um and I this is uh, four five five pages or so and it's a pretty good section and it's I think it's a really good entrance, really dramatic entrance and cool entrance for Demandrid. If only the all the Sharon stuff didn't make me go, eh. Yeah. You know? Because yeah. cause cause he him he himself that's is a pretty darn good entrance. You know, that's that's a you know, it, it's reminiscent of the first appearance of Vader, you know, when he when he you know walks through the smoke and is so imposing and everything. And it's, it's it's got that feel to it. It's just I'm kind of meh about the whole Sharon thing. So it it doesn't land as well as it could. Yeah, and uh, isomorphic many books ago when he was complaining about the Shanchen, he was talking about uh, having to learn a whole new culture. Mm. And we just learned the Aiel. We just kind of got the two rivers people down. And we got all these different countries, and now we have the Shanchen, and we got to learn a whole new culture. Yeah. Well, there's so much time spent in these pages right now with Egwene trying to figure out their culture and their hierarchy and how it is. And it's like, yeah, and we just got that thrown in our face. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is where Noel could have come in because he theoretically had been to Shara and he brings it up once or twice. Mm -hmm. but you could have had him just like for a page and a half telling a fantastical story to Olver or something. About that, the that seems too yeah. ridiculous to be real, and then all of a sudden they show up here at the mm -hmm. very end. You're like, "Holy crap, that was that was real!" You know that 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 wasn't yeah. just a, a spinning a yarn. And you wouldn't have to spend time in the action moment explaining the culture. Mm -hmm. So it's you know you could have had a downtime moment explaining the culture earlier, and uh, yeah. Now it does it does give you that like you said you you had that Quetzalcoatl kind of feel to it which i that mm -hmm. that had that he draws so much from mythology that that had to be on purpose and it as someone would say oh they're not the that's not the aztec culture that's not the mayan culture that's not the inca culture but actually if you combine all three of those together mm -hmm. it kind of is that's, yeah <laughs> that that's that's where it works that's why it's yeah. so good and that's that's why it, it's so kind of infinitely uh discussable is because we can talk about you know the Shinarans, these heavy cavalry that are that are in a lot of ways reminiscent of the the French or German late Middle Ages, and yet culturally, there's also this strong samurai culture. I mean, even the way they dress, the, even the, the top knots, the haikus, and all that, it's because he's blending things and he's well, blending people, them so seamlessly. And yeah, people call it uninventive to basically draw from already existing things, and I'm like, no, that's a good writer's trick because yeah you're already semi invested in it because you have this heuristic in your mind of what it is. Yes. And he doesn't have to spend 10 pages, boring pages telling me about it. I already mm. have this idea and he can just point out a few things. Well, it, it's why fantasy in general, the, the fantasy genre in general is, is almost always a kind of medieval Europe setting with just some kind of fantastical element to it. Why? Because we all have these, stories and myths and legends of the the chivalrous knight and you know camelot and all of these things so you are immediately grounded in this make-believe world it, it, it's a shorthand for helping you suspend your disbelief mm -hmm. all right and then we go to perrin and perrin is bouncing around hunting for slayer and can't find him um 
but instead he finds Grendel skulking about and there's this moment it's a couple pages into his section it's page 409 for me where they're they're following her and and he's spying on her in this tent and she looks back um and it's Perrin's reaction was immediate he created a paper thin wall between her and him her side painted with an exact replica of the landscape behind him his side transparent she looked right at him but didn't see him and turned away beside him Gaul let out a very soft breath of relief and here's the the opening part is what's key Perrin's reaction was immediate and then here is where it, it kind of brings it home of him thinking how did i do that parent thought it wasn't something he had practiced it had merely seemed right and you know my first thought was and, and we talked about this kind of ad nauseum when when hopper was training him is that the void isn't just a sword form mm -hmm. and the wolf dream isn't just about dreaming it was it was always something more than that and and this is Perrin knowing the lesson rather than just having learned it. Well, and which is also why the blacksmith was the right person for the job, because blacksmiths create something out of the world, and he's creating the world around him versus mm -hmm. being a part, being like a mat who's reactionary to the world. Uh, my, I had a, a little thought on that same page where he talks about making the soundproof barrier. A, a barrier of nothingness how does that even work and i said oh he's a yeti because <laughs> that's how yetis work they have a vacuum inside yeah the <laughs> I, I love that little moment of and i'm wondering you know if that was i don't feel this doesn't feel like a jordan chapter so i'm wondering if that was a bit of an homage to jordan from sanderson mm -hmm. of how how does how does no air stop sound well you're not a physicist <laughs> you're just a blacksmith <laughs> but it, i i let I, I kind of like the haha, -ha, you know, not in wink to the reader because the reader should know if you've mm -hmm. had basic yeah. science. Yeah, sound waves can't go through a vacuum like that. Well, yeah. like they can, but it's otherwise we wouldn't be able to send off radio waves into space. But right, it works um, different. <laughs> then the the next page over, there's an interesting bit that I actually, I, I think you could criticize this, but I think it works because. So having a character talk to themselves happens a lot in TV, especially. And it's really cheap exposition because most of the time people don't talk out loud. They think to themselves. So it's, it's cheap exposition because it most of the time doesn't make sense of why is this person talking out loud? But here it actually makes sense with, with Grendel's vanity and her rage and the fact that she's at this point with all she's been through, she was already a crazy person in the psycho sense. Now she's probably legitimately crazy with, with, with having her, you know, being killed, having her soul ripped out and then shoved into this new awful body. And no, it, it actually works as exposition here because one, it's not cheap because she's not giving anything away to parent. We, the reader, can infer what's going on because we have more information, but it's not like she's Bond villain monologuing, telling her whole plan here. Mm -hmm. So I, I actually think the talking out loud works. Um, and then my last thought on this chapter is when Lanfear shows up. Of... Yeah, I just, uh, one point on kind of a meta point is we're getting all this dream stuff in Perrin's world. And basically the whole dream world arc from here on out is Perrin. Mm -hmm. When we had so much buildup that Egwene was a great dream walker and these, these wise ones are great dream walkers and everything. Yeah. And if we're going to have two battlefronts, one in the real world and one in the dream world, why wasn't there more inclusion of the Aiel dream walkers as a thing? They're wasted out in Thakandar right now when they could have been fighting a front that we had a whole new battle in, which we only have a one kind of a a two person battle here. Well, especially someone like I don't I don't know. I don't know if we ever even see her again, but like Bayer 
she can barely channel Cerulea. They're not much use in this battle because they can barely channel. So mm -hmm. where would they be of more use? Walking around in the dream world, keeping an eye on things there because they it's kind of dumb because they know, I, I believe they've warned some of the others about the Forsaken are wandering the dream world. Be careful. So mm -hmm. they, they know the Forsaken are messing around in the dream world. So yeah, and especially here, we we figure out what Grendel's doing here. She's messing with the great captain's dreams. And a dreamer seeing what's happening to the great captains could have said, Ooh, something's happening while they're sleeping. Yeah. And yeah. then you could have had the Aiel say, Hey, we've got another battle to fight. We need to find the Forsaken mm -hmm. in the dream be, world. Be, because and... that that star field of dreams, mm -hmm. we know what that is. The well, Lanfear the, tells Perrin what she's doing. The wise ones absolutely yeah. know what that is, but this is brand new to Perrin. Yeah. Right? So, and you have that link there because Gaul is there, and Gaul makes comments about, you know, you may be even stronger here than the wise ones, and Perrin's like, oh, no, they have tons of experience. Well, well, there's your link. That was that was the line that made me make so, that comment. Was Send yeah. Gaul back and say, hey, Byer, Cerulea, some of you, you know, that aren't aren't of use in the channeling in the battle, there's another battlefield here where your expertise could be used. Yeah, and yeah, there's like three opponents, but they're also forsaken. So we need all of you. <laughs> the 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 bit at the end here though that I really liked about Lanfear is how how she tries to tempt Perrin. Mm-hmm. And it, it made me wonder how much of this is is really Lanfear and how much of this is just her knowing people and being able to manipulate because I kind of feel like the little bit we've some of the little bit we know about Myron and, and, you know, especially from loose Theron's thoughts and some of his outbursts um, from inside Rand's head is I, I kind of feel like this is, is also a little bit her, like maybe this is why I, I actually think it's a lot her. Yeah. That, because that maybe this is why she, she's actually serious that, you know what, Perrin, I'll let you be my man. You know, you can stand beside me. But it's more than that because she's finally given up on Luz Theron, but that doesn't mean she it, it isn't a motivating factor for her. Mm -hmm. So her her passion for him, we'll use that word. That I think that's the best word. Her passion for him was trying to get with him and be have power with him. When I'm that rejection steal your best friend. When that rejection came through, what better way to redirect the exact same passion to revenge? Mm -hmm. And what better way to get revenge than to seduce your stalwart, you know, ally, your best friend, you know, the guy who's who's basically defending your back in this battle and tr and make him a traitor to you. And that in and of itself to a personality like that in Lanfear would make Perrin the most attractive person in the world. You know, I, I've never thought about this before, but it just occurred to me that. All right. So. um there's this there's this saying that shouldn't be a hard and fast rule because I, there are always exceptions. But the idea that even a villain is the hero in his own story, that's not necessarily true all the time. And it just occurred to me that actually that's not true with the Forsaken because they actually embraced the evil. They embraced it and said, I don't care that it's bad. I like it and I'm going to do it because I can. Except... For Lanfear, I think she is the hero in her own story. And I think this, you know, this this moment here with Perrin where she's trying to tempt him, uh, save lives, she said, prevent children from starving, stop the weak from being bullied, end wickedness, reward honor, power to encourage men to be straightforward and honest with one another. Um, you could do so much good, Perrin Ibarra, at yeah, she is the hero in her own story because she is going to make the world better, whether it likes it or not. Which my note for that was, oh, on power, spoken like a true lefty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're going to do so much good when we have the power. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's I think it's the difference between Lenin and Stalin. Some people give like to try and give Lenin a pass because, oh, he was a true believer. He was still a very bad man and did some very bad things. But I think he he was the hero of his own story. He was the Lanfear because he was doing it for the greater good. The fact mm -hmm. that he initiated the killing of millions. Eh, well, you know, 
gotta gotta crack some eggs to make some omelets. Stalin was a straight up gangster, literally. That's where he came from. He was a gangster, and so so he is the. I don't care about any of this good greater goodness. I I care about power, and mm-hmm. so he, he is your more typical forsaken. All right, chapter twenty three, the last chapter we're gonna go over today. Um, I was gonna stop at the be- before this chapter because uh, my head doesn't want to stop hurting but then i looked ahead and saw that the next chapter is back to matt and well we might need some extra time for that next (laughs) next time because of the way things have been going with matt um yeah i'll say this is this is one where uh the greater good comes through and this is the opposite of the avienda jato because gawain er it's written in a way that I don't think Sanderson liked him very much as we've talked about before. So he wanted to make him be doing a bad thing here, but the ring's a great idea. And See, it's, if there was never a time, a uh, desperate, desperate times, desperate measures, right? Mm-hmm. The ring was a great idea. Now, open communication and not being a simp earlier would have been better. Like, hey, I've got these things. I know you don't like them, but we are in the last battle. So I'm going to keep it in the hip pocket as a trump card. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is the Joker if they pull an ace. All right. And that kind of honesty, I think, would have gone a long way in liking their relationship. Because you could have had her, her, him, and Hall over it, but been like, well, let's just stay out of that situation. You know? So the, the last chapter in this point of view is actually what my note is because, and you referenced this when we were talking earlier, I think addressing some of the comments he had, uh, this is Gawain here. He had told himself he wouldn't use the rings, but that had been during battle when he'd been tempted to try to make a name for himself. This was different. This was protecting a Gwen. He could allow an exception for this. And my thought was, is this rationalizing or is this the truth? Well, and, it is and post hoc to be rationalization, and sometimes that's right. Okay, not all post hoc ra- rationalization is incorrect. No, but mm-hmm. if it's when I say rationalization, I mean no, he's still doing it to make a name for himself, but he's rationalizing it because it's a different situation. I don't think so because it's such a private situation. Mm. He knows he's going to mm. take the only person that's going to know about this is the person he's going to take hell from from doing it. Mm-hmm. The the other thing that I kind of noticed in this is that when he's thinking about it, he th- he thinks that Lewin told him he might die. I think that is a rationalization because I'm pretty sure Lewin told her and the 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 the, the former Domine who first told him about the rings, no, you die. Mm-hmm. Once you activate the ring, you will die. I I think. So I think the might, I think that is rationalization and kind of wishful thinking on his part. Yeah. Because he, he either wasn't paying attention or he didn't want to pay attention. Yeah, that that was his bias. But as far yeah. as his justification for using it, I actually think the case is pretty solid for doing it, mm-hmm. especially since mm-hmm. you don't get out of this situation without it. Yeah, no, <laughs> that, that's a good point, because here we switch to we switch to Egwene's point of view and um jumping ahead a bit is is when it's like god when finally gets back to predator yeah when he's standing on that the waterfall he doesn't know if there's a rock down there he just knows predator behind gotta go yep so he jumps and he makes the leap of faith and 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 we we find out that this 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 channel or whatever she is that that captures Egwene, she's been watching them and set up an ambush and when gawain comes back and Egwene asks what took you so long i got ambushed by six people and he just says it so casually. Well, yeah, because one, you're already a really good swordsman, and two, they can't see you. So he would be dead if it weren't for the ring. You know, that's that's a good point. But actually, my first thought here, right at the beginning of this uh chapter, and this is really annoying in it, annoying to me personally, but uh Egwene has this thought right at the beginning here of every child of um she wasn't as good as at sneaking as Nynaeve and Perrin were, but she was from the two rivers. Every child in Emmons Field learned how to move in the woods without startling game. And that might seem like a uh that might seem like 
trite or or silly or no this is why i can't garden this is why i suck at gardening because my life doesn't depend on it yeah 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 yep. the, there were times that that if you wanted protein you had to go catch it you know my my great my grandparents and great grandparents were great gardeners and that's why i do it is because i i learned helping them except they learned because they literally had to survive you know during the dust bowl during the great depression it's if you wanted to eat you're gonna grow it yourself <laughs> so no this is this is not a contrivance that this innkeeper's daughter can sneak pretty well in the woods you know it's no she comes from a place where if you want protein you better go catch it mm -hmm. um did you have any other thoughts on this Egwene section we just have a good moment where it is it is kind of good that Leolin is the the one to come through because you were kind of yeah. hoping for that because of the semi justified bad treatment she was getting from Egwene and it which also made it a little predictable but at the same time it, it predictable in a way where you wanted it to kind of happen you wanted well, it but also predictable way. because as Leowen says I take my oath seriously yeah mm -hmm. she does she's a very serious person yeah, she's not got an going extreme, anywhere yeah we got an extreme bias from Egwene because her only experience with Shanshan isn't all the good stuff that Matt noticed and that Rand eventually noticed. It was only the you're a dog and you're less than yeah, human. Yeah. 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 Uh, my only thought about this section was when Bale Doman shows up, the voice I hear in my head when he talks, and this may be because you kids are playing Baldur's Gate 3, so I went back and started playing Baldur's Gate 1, and so I hear, my Odin's as clean as an elven arse. <laughs> That's the voice uh... I hear when Bale Doman speaks is the the generic innkeeper from Baldur's Gate 1. Uh, for those that haven't played, BG3 is worth a play. I, I'm on my third playthrough, though I don't have time right now with now that school's back in, but uh um, it, it is it is a it's it's the best semi-woke game there is and I think semi-woke is the best you can hope for at yeah, this point. Yeah. They did it in a way where everything was kind of believable like the badass female fighters are of different races that you can attach these kind of things to you know one's a half devil okay well how big and strong is a half devil female as big and strong as you want it to be <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. speaking of big strong ladies uh then we switch to an avienda section and i didn't have any thoughts on this uh except that it's mostly good although there were some moments kind of where it gets a little messy uh when like when when she kills the when she she finds and kills the black aja the two black aja and and what we know is probably grendel runs away i thought that was a little convoluted and confusing it took me a second to kind of it's one of those sections that sanderson does sometimes where we're oh, we haven't gotten to the good uh random runaway scene yet which random runaway scene uh spoiler alert for the next 10 seconds uh oh it's later i thought you meant in this second no we'll, no. we'll, we'll save it for later then i'll I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll i'll keep that in mind as i'm reading and it'll probably hit me and i'll probably yell at the the, the one every fan oh. on the interweb said what the fuck <laughs> and i remember that one vividly so hopefully something new that answers what the fuck yeah. in this next read through pops in pops up but well, yeah. speaking of something to do, um, I don't really have any thoughts on the Avienda section. You know, it's fine, whatever. Yeah, it's it's um, action. I mean, it's 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 done pretty well. But then we we get to a pretty good this this is the section that I was referencing when we were talking in the comments. This feels very Jordan. I think sections of this may have been written or it was you know outlined or something. And it, it wouldn't surprise me with these Rand sections at the end because we know the very last scene was written by Jordan, that he had had that in his mind. He said a number of times in interviews that the, the, the genesis of the story came from the ending is that just kind of really out of nowhere, just that, you know, you could spend a lifetime trying to figure out how the creative process works in the brain, I think, of just kind of out of nowhere this this image this scene popped into his head and so the very last scene of the book was the first thing he ever wrote 
And then, and then he kind of worked his way backwards of, you know, what is this, who is this character and what is this world? And then that's where the story came from. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me then if a number of these Rand scenes here from here to the end were either written by or heavily noted, outlined by Jordan. And this one in particular really feels like Jordan. Um, so, for instance, you're right off the bat here on this first page, the 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 chapter title at the edge of time and rand has this thought here on this first page of uh, uh they stood at the edge of time itself which uh, again it seems strange to say when you go and look up the word count of jordan's books and especially compare that to your average you know fiction re release and it's it's ludicrous and yet he was so economical with his words and and just that ha it's literally half a sentence and it tells you so much about what is going on here and we got a hint of this in parents section when lanfear talks about time being weird uh in the dream world and especially around the boar and mm -hmm. rand has had this thought before too about reality distorting yeah well there, it has to be because when they were sealed away actually in the boar, they were basically in stasis. Mm -hmm. But the further out from the center you were, the more time affected you. That's why we have Agonor and Bethamel, who yep. are basically walking mummies at that point in book one when they show up. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, their their power held them together, but at the same time, they had aged to the point of beyond uh, to to the point where you're basically necrotic walking around. They weren't dead yet. They weren't walking dead, but they were aged to, to beyond natural means because they were yeah. wielders of the power, just like it takes forever to age the stronger you are with the power. And uh, But someone like Demandred, who was close to the center, comes out a young, strapping young stud. You know, Grendel comes out all busty and, and voluptuous, you know. Landfear is really unclear because she came out really early. Yeah, it, but, it, but she still it, has all her physical faculties. Yeah, it it makes me wonder if we just saw her first and the others were already all out. Because to to your point, yeah, she unless she's mirror of misting herself the whole time. No, because then the new body wouldn't make a difference. That's a good point. Because she would just keep mirror of misting. Yeah. Um. But right before this, we had we had in Avienda scene the, the kind of the takeaway there is she, right at the beginning she's looking up and she you know holds a hand up waves goodbye to Rand and she sees the entrance and it's like she describes it as the blackest black, like a nothingness. And then here, this line they stood at the edge of time itself and and, and that's what I was referring to is I think this is Jordan the the analogy the allegory of the dark one as a black hole and and the way that it is it sucks in everything mm -hmm. and it is just pure nothingness yeah and i'm i can't remember who was talking it might have been dr roller gator or it might have been eric weinstein somebody was talking about how we could travel long distances and it was something about the closer you get to a black hole, the slower time goes mm -hmm. as well. So if you can basically whip around a black hole, you could slow time to the point that you would go an incredibly long distance in almost zero time. Mm -hmm. But of course, we haven't figured the whole part about, you know, getting close enough to a black hole without getting sucked into it. You know, yep. you know, we could get a lot of power from the sun, too, if we can get close enough. But, uh, you know, that, that's problematic as well. <laughs> um the other reason this feels very jordan like is the other half of that sentence he just he just very very smoothly transitions to and still tom Marilyn found a smile that it is you you don't you don't need to belabor the point you don't need to try too damn hard to make a joke it's he he makes a simple comment of maybe compose a good ballad or two and it brings a smile to Rand's face there's a character arc there that i thought i think sanderson might have dropped because with 
when Royal Reign was gone, we had a ever increasing brooding pessimistic Tom. Mm. And we have moments of him starting to come back, like when Elaine finally recognizes that he's someone from her past and mm -hmm. he kind of finds purpose in that where he's like, oh, I got something to live for now because I loved this little girl. I used to bounce on my knee. Mm -hmm. But we never got when Moraine comes back. We get we get some third person just noticing that they're next to each other. But we never get this re rediscovering of joy that Tom should have gotten from that. This re uh, this increased vigor that we get right here, right now. It's the people dropping like flies thing. It came out of nowhere. It mm. was just there at the last moment when we needed it. it well, and we've had several more rain points of view where you could have put it in there. Yeah. Where was Tom during that? Right. This is where That's... banter would have worked because Tom would have been happy again. And he could have, he could be pulling more rain out of her, her funks and her well, frustrations. But, but also I, it just, just realized dang it of what was he doing during at the beginning of of shadows of book four it's he's trying to help rand in his own way which at the time included kind of deflecting some of the stuff moraine was doing and so as her husband and presumably new warder when she's having that back and forth with rand and rand leaves why didn't why wasn't he there in the corner you know just composing a ballad or, or playing the harp and then when Rand leaves okay wife he's gone now so I can disagree with you mm -hmm. and why couldn't that have been a back and forth there because Tom is going to instinctively has instinctively from the very beginning taken to the boys Rand especially of well I'm, I'm gonna, gonna stick go up for Rand yeah. a little bit here I was gonna go there because Tom's character arc and one of the things we why he's one of the most beloved characters in the whole series. I would I would say he's probably top five for if you were to just poll a lot of the uh, uh, the fans. He he is a guy who had basically hit rock bottom, even though he was flamboyant. He was yeah, Robin Williams. Yeah. He was a he was a depressant that would use his extroversion to have meaning. And the boys gave him a purpose in life. He follows Matt out of Tar Valon, not because he has to, but because he just feels like this kid needs him right now. Mm -hmm. He was with them in Whitebridge because he felt like they needed him. In fact, he says that out loud because of his experience with mm -hmm. Owen and his and, and all of that. And we, you know, you could have built that to the you gave me meaning in life again. And someone needs to tell your tale. Mm -hmm. He makes a little sn or snarky comment here, but I think it could have been a bigger, more meaningful comment. Yeah. 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 My other, my other thought on this scene was thanks again, you shit show for ruining a nice moment because that Tom was utterly humorless. I, I cannot envision that, that Tom, maybe the actor's good, but the way he was written cannot do this scene. He, he, there's no humor there. There's no there's no quip and a wry smile. That, that guy was way too damn serious. I was like, this isn't, I don't know who this is, but it's not Tom and it's annoying me. Yeah. All well, right. They, they tried to make him too, too cool. Oh, you, you know, uh, it, uh, I had this thought while I was reading the scene and when I had that thought about you stupid show, it dawned on me that it's like he's doing an imitation of Clint Eastwood from Pale Rider. Mm. That's who that Tom is. And it's it's that's that's not who Tom Marilyn is at all in the books. So I don't know where you guys got that, but he's not Clint Eastwood from Pale Rider or or you know, and that that's being generous, you know. Uh Okay, the next page there's an interesting thought here from um from rand when naive points out that the wound's broken open and he's bleeding um blood on the rocks naive raised a hand to her mouth it has to happen naive rand said you cannot stop it the prophecy 
does not say anything about me living through this. I've always found that odd, haven't you? Why would it speak of the blood, but not what comes after? Um, I don't know if I'm reading too much into this and wondering, is this a clue to what happens at the end or not? You know, what, what do you guys think? So I don't want to get into it until we actually get to the end. Mm -hmm. Because my, my other thought was, if this isn't a clue as to, you know, we know he asks, how, how can I defeat the Dark One and survive? So finding a way to survive has been on his mind, but he doesn't seem to have found a way because really all the way up into the end, he's being fatalistic. That's what the whole conversation with Katsuin is about. Um, and so my other thought was, is this just a reiteration of the idea that you know, I think it, I think Min brings this up somewhere when when someone makes the point. Oh well, well, then we have to succeed. Oh, it's because they're talking about visions of things mm -hmm. that will happen that that must happen after the last battle. And Min says no, because if the Dark One wins, there is no pattern. And so is is this just a reiteration of that? Of the reasons there are no prophecies of the dragon after the last battle is that there is no after if he fails. Mm. Oh, so. okay, I see where you yeah. Or, or is the fact that there is no prophecy of the dragon after the last battle somehow a clue as to what happens to the last dragon after the battle? I don't know. Because mm -hmm. that, that seems to be what Rand is inferring here or intimating here. Um, but I don't know. I, I don't If that's supposed to be a clue, I don't know what it's cluing me into. Yeah, and that's... This is where the... The dark one, if they win, you know they have to destroy everything mm -hmm. because life is circular and it has to be because I eat something today doesn't mean I don't have to eat for the rest of my life. And it's just a meta meta world version of that. Mm -hmm. We have this battle and finish this thing now. Well, you have to do it again or else you're not. The world isn't alive if you don't have to do it again. So it's uh. Mm -hmm. And and that's what drove Ishi crazy. That's what he wanted to end because he was tired of doing it. Yeah, yeah. In in the in this world of reincarnation, well, Ishi from the the Age of Legends realized that that's what's happening, and he didn't want to do it again, even though he couldn't feel his previous lives. So it's still one life for him, though he was going to be recycled again. Although again. I do wonder, with his strong connection to the Dark One now, has that has that barrier broken down, and does he is that what one of the that might have been the te been temptation? More nihilistic here, yeah, that might have been the temptation. Mm -hmm. He his research may have taken him into well something like the Portal Stones, which pre existed the Age of Legends. He may have been studying something like the Portal Stones and felt mm. it all, and couldn't handle it. Because he was dark every time. Yeah, we get a little bit of that. We're just just not knowing what they saw, but just from the reactions of Matt and Ingtar mm -hmm. and some of the others of, ooh, I don't know what you saw, but it hit you. Mm -hmm. It wasn't good, whatever it was. And once the memory's there, it can be a trauma piece for the rest of your life. And not only that, a trauma piece that you keep reinventing in your mind for the rest of your life. So the reinventions of yourself can either go positively or negatively. Mm -hmm. It's that's the self that we, we have the phenomenon of self-fulfilling prophecy. And the more negative it is, the more likely we are to do it. Speaking of self-fulfilling prophecies, la last comment I have on this is right at the end here at the end of the chapter there's an all caps that we have seen before mm -hmm. um and and I think I think this came up when we were when we were doing the the end of the eye of the world is and I don't think you knew that that was the voice of the creator but this is basically confirming that that's what that was because I don't know that Jordan ever explicitly in a Q&A answered that question but here, I think we're explicitly getting the answer here or as close of an answer, you know, as, as we often get, which is very rarely direct because that's, you know, where's the fun in that? You know, part of this mm -hmm. part of Jordan's style is he wanted you to infer, you know, because that, 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 that made for a more interesting tale as well as pulling you into the world because we have to infer all the time around us. We don't, we don't know answers, especially when we're dealing with people. I'm not inside your head. You know, mm -hmm. in this book, I'm inside Rand's head. If I'm sitting next to him, I'm not inside his head. I don't know what the hell he's thinking, right? Um, 
but it is time let the task be undertaken. The voice spoke with the inevitability of an earthquake, the words vibrating through him, more than sound in the air, far more. The words spoke as if from one soul to another. Moraine gasped, eyes opening wide. That part to me was interesting that I don't, I'm wondering if she actually heard the words or if she just felt them, you know, if the others heard it. Rand was not surprised. He had heard this voice once before and he realized that he had been expecting it, hoping for it at least, which the hoping for is important because I think the creator seems to be a an almost a, a deist version of God in, in the theological sense of the, the clockmaker. The, the creator made the clock and every once in a while comes in to wind it, but otherwise leaves it be. But this is an important moment to right at the darkest, most difficult time of the dragon's cycle. You were there at the beginning to let him know, okay, it has begun and I will help, but I'm not going to take an active part. It's basically how I read those words at the mm -hmm. end of Eye of the World. And now, you know, you're not alone. It's, it's, I, I have been helping as much as I can, you know, through the pattern to get you to this point. So having, having that, a psychological boost at this critical moment is a big effing deal. Well, this is like, uh, like we go back to physics kind of panpsychist is the whole universal consciousness thing is everything is conscious. We just are kind of one of the higher aware versions of that. Mm -hmm. So the more basically simply simple you are uh, in structure, the less of that you have. And but we're all just this one collective consciousness which actually interplays because my atoms right now are only my atoms for right now. And every atom in my body is going to be different in seven years, but I'm still the same person. Ship of Theseus going forward, right? So it's it, from one soul to another. And we talk about, I actually liked our conversation on the dream world being the collective consciousness of all humanity. The soul in this whole series is a collective essence of the creator and the dark one. The problem is if the dark one breaks through that barrier, which should exist and it says, I won't from the creator, but there also might be an, I can't because I refuse to bust through the barrier mm -hmm. that allows me to intercede. Whereas the dark one is perfectly fine with it. Mm -hmm. And the people who follow him are perfectly fine because they have a greater essence of dark one. But the soul is your combined essence of all that, and it reforms as time goes on. Yeah, I hadn't even thought of this until you were talking about it there, but um, that phrase, from one soul to another, seems odd because it almost seems like it's anthropomorphizing the creator. But I, I actually think that's Jordan's personal theology showing through because the idea for most christians if not all all the ones i know of anyway is that when when god says in genesis chapter four or whatever it is five let us make man in our own image that it, it it's understood that that doesn't mean this that doesn't mean this fleshy stuff here that the image of god is our soul Mm -hmm. That we have a portion, a tiny fraction, a bit of the divine within us, and that is our soul. And so from one soul to another, I think I think what Jordan is saying there is the soul, that we are actually all one. We all come from this greater part, and thus we are all connected through this divine nature. And I'm I'm wondering if that's what he means with that phrase, from one soul to another. Well, yeah, and so... From the religious side, uh, we'll go to the to the left on the screen for Heath, and from the physics side, it's an accumulated uh, accumulating effect. So let's look at the word creator, all things that grow. Let's look at the destroyer, the dark one, all things that entropy and die. Mm -hmm. So humanity needs the creators, the essence of creator or else it will eventually die off because Trollocs left with no humanity die because they just eat themselves until they're gone. 
where humans, yes, we have our problems, but at the same time, well, yeah, the, there's actually a dichotomy there. So humans are kind of the in-between because then you've got things like the, the, the Ogier who are, are, are very keen on the growth aspect of life. They are a net positive with growth. Trollocs are a net negative because they will eventually eat everything and then eat each other. Uh, and humans are in between. Sometimes we fight. Sometimes we do bad things. Sometimes good people come in and we typically are a net neutral with that. And so the creator is all things that grow and the dark one being all things that die. We can't let one take over because you can't, you can only grow so much and you can only die. So I ingest food, but all of the food I ingested is now me. So it, it is it, every essence of everything I, I, I take in is me at that moment. But then I also lose stuff. The bacteria in my gut breaks it down and I poop and my skin cells flake off. My hair falls out. You know, all of, I, I breathe carbon. I breathe it out. So some of the food I eat is actually breathed out. So there's, there's a balance of entropy and there's a net growth for a while. And then there's a net decline. And this is a battle of losing that balance in life. And Rand finally gets it that it's about the balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The problem is because one side overstepped its bounds, you need an overcorrection in the other side with a conduit in between that restores the balance. And that's him. And uh, yeah, I don't think the, I don't think the creator is I created every, uh, or I made the dark one. I think the creator is I'm the essence of things that grow. Cause you can use the same word the same way or those two different ways. Interesting thought. Um, all right. So speaking of interesting thoughts, we, We'll start next time on chapter 24, where we're, we're, we're going to get into some <laughs> math, but to? yes, you do. But at least it starts off, well, hopefully not too bad. I can't remember exactly what happens in the chapter, but the the opening point of view is for Tuana. Don't say Tuan or she'll have to kill you. Um, and, and Sanderson writes her pretty well. So, well, And this is one of my we'll beefs see. with Matt going we'll from what we've done in this book and going forward. Is Matt stubborn, but he is also adaptable. Mm. And the fact that that Matt keeps calling her Tuan is so disrespectful to your wife because of her culture that I don't see the real Matt from book three being that way. He might think it in his head. I, oh, it's taking me a long time to get used to this or whatever, but he's adaptable. There's a part of him that just wants to make her happy too. I, I could why see... Would th why would that yeah. not bleed over to a major yeah. thing in her culture? It, it, especially in public. Especially in public. Yeah, and it would actually lend weight to the times he does defy her. Hmm. When he's like... He, he, he goes with the easy stuff. Oh, you're for, for Chuana? Okay, it's going to take a second. Give me some... Give actually, me some that, that's give me a, a good point leeway, from you know? last time that I hadn't even really thought of is when when he intercedes to say you know hey you can trust rand he says he calls her to one and she doesn't he she doesn't you know correct him that would have been much more impactful if he would have been if he would have you know understood and at least by tried to as, now yeah. And, and, yeah and he's he's trying to call her for Tuana, and then all of a sudden in what is a more intimate moment he says hey he uses the name of the woman he fell a, kind of fell in love with, right? Is yeah. is if he if he would have then hey Tawan, Tawan, look at me. You can trust Rand. In that more intimate moment, that would have been much more impactful if he had been trying to and, and that's where Sanderson never got the Matt. Matt is the reason he's the rascal is because just like every two rivers person, he can be stubborn, mm -hmm. but he's only stubborn when it counts. Mm. He's the rascal because he's willing to do anything, even if it breaks the rules, if it's a net positive at the time. And, it, you know, when you're young, that's a good laugh or an adventure. When you've been in many, many, many battles and killed Kooladin, it is, 
how do I get out of this next one with my head still attached mm-hmm. to me mm-hmm. after you've been hung because you had a bad deal with some some people that you had to fight again later? How mm-hmm. do you get out of the maze? That he did. He actually wrote, "How do you get out of the maze?" Really well. Take that whole adventure sequence and make it his personality, and it would have been so much better. Yeah. And Fortuana, you want you want me to call you Fortuana? As if I can get my dick wet every once in a while, that I'll call you Fortuana. You know, it's it, that's <laughs> let's let's be real. We're all guys here. You know, and uh, it's but then they're in battle, and he says, "No, this thing that's your tradition that's going to get us killed." Mm-hmm. And that would add weight mm-hmm. to to those statements. Otherwise, it's just stubborn guy. It's a, mm-hmm. it, I, I use the word over and over again, and I will use it till the end of this book. It's a caricature. Yeah, yeah, it's a good way to describe it. Well, keep that in mind as we get into chapter 24 here, because I think that's going to kind of answer a lot of questions that we have about Matt in these next couple of chapters. All right. Well, we will see y'all then. We will see y'all this weekend for some sort of social episode of some sort. What we have to tease it. What did we talk about? You wanted, what was it about RFK you wanted to talk about? Oh, okay. If you want to get into that, something that he talked about that he referenced in his speech uh, last Saturday or Saturday before um, when he endorsed Trump is, is he made the comment that, from about a hundred years ago, the average um, age of, of starting puberty for girls has gone down mm, like six that's years. That's right. You, I needed to look up some literature on that. Okay. And so, the, and then you uh, had some interesting thoughts about how the mind affects that. And there's a lot of repercussions to that, that I think, you know, he just mentioned it and I was like, Whoa, that's, there are some serious implications to that. Yeah, and this was actually a discussion in class last night because I can't stand this teacher, but I uh, she randomly assigns groups when we do our group discussion. And the the four of us, actually, we had a great group discussion. And one of the things was uh, social psychologists pretty much say everything's a social construct. And that's that's where they get in trouble because it's wrong. Mm-hmm. Not everything's a social construct. And what... Uh, we were just talking about Matt. The Matt for the first nine books was really good at parsing out what was right and what was a construct. Names are a construct. Mm. That's something we socially give each other. Your parents gave it to you. As you grow up, you might change that, but you're really changing it based on what you think people are going to perceive about you, right? So even nicknames... Are, are, are like that right so somebody makes an observation about you and they use it and it becomes a thing and you actually change your entire character when i became the mule the mule's kind of different than i was when i was the shy fat kid right so it's it, it's a different it, 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 these are things that are socially influenced but not everything's a social construct mm-hmm. in fact most social constructs are actually based on human genetics because most social constructs are downstream of human behavior in general. Like, okay, do we have social norms around sex? Yes, because we have to account for sexual reproduction, so it has to exist. We have to account for, oh, this thing called jealousy. We have to account for economic needs, which resources, which is, again, biological, because if we call it money now, but back in the day was how many buffalo I could kill or whatever, or how many tubers I can find in the ground. So all of these norms we have are based around all of these things that are biological. Something like the name, complete social construct. But, so he would he would just, okay, that's fine. I can adapt to this situation. Whereas, oh, we're going to lose this battle, which means I die. That's a little bit biologically based. You can only die once. Even if we're in a world here with uh, reincarnation, you really your body only dies once, and so he's he's going to react differently there. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, I, I yeah the the now how that affects your puberty and all that pressure is real, stress mm-hmm. is real. Uh, there's a lot of other components to that, which will I mean this could be that might be the whole episode if we go down that hole because what's in our water now. 
BPAs, well, mm-hmm. uh, as he says, the VAXs, right? The the uh, birth control. Uh, I remember there was a thing, and it turned out to be not that big a deal not that statistically significant but something with the way we do uh eggs now and but the thing is we might have to cover all of them because if we have a 50 percent effect right now so i'm just making up numbers so i i don't know the actual numbers but as far as this is average age of puberty and now this is average age of puberty and it's 50 percent different well one percent from the eggs 1% from the, the injections, 1% from modern medicine, 1% from uh, mm. social issues, 1% from, you, you know, th- they all could be in it. That's the whole uh, injection argument is, yeah, that chemical in there might not affect you with one shot, but we get 73 now. It's different. Mm-hmm. One bottle of water hydrates me. 73 bottles of water will kill me. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> are all of these things adding up and what can, what the hell can we do about it? Cause some of them are also good for us. Plastics in your food. Yeah. Testosterone effects, all this stuff. Plastics covering your food. No E. Coli. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so trade-offs as well. So, yep. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, that, that's there, a tease. We might, we might find something else because there's a lot of other stuff going on. I'm intrigued about the, the new defamation legal battles because people are suing Kamala Harris now because of her, her Kamala HQ tweets, which are defamatory. Bring it <laughs> and, on. Yeah. And, but she's also a great lawyer. So she probably already dotted some I's and crossed some T's that mm-hmm. the reactionary portion isn't seeing yet. So all that, and she's also yeah. got the courts in her favor, but uh, although I think some of them are actively suing her in Texas on purpose to do exactly what they're doing to mm-hmm. Trump in New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, the, the, the kid glo- gloves are off and we get to suffer from it as normal people in the United States. So that could also be fun because we might be really? in that process by then. Yeah. All right. Well, we will all roses and sunshine that. because we got Matt coming up next wheel of time. We've got these fun things that are so yeah, we need a fun topic. What what let's let's do like 20 oh, minutes shoot. of fun next time. We Fantasy have to football. give we 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 will have to end with a little bit of fun because we're going to have to give our preseason predictions. Yeah, and um, it's a little unfair cuz there will be one game have already been played, but And it's going to be a big part, one because Mah- the, Mahomes and the Chefs versus Jackson and the Ravens that could be a big do- what that game will say a lot I think about how the AFC is going to play out. Yeah, and I think I had a fantastic fantasy draft. Oh, I'm not sure. I did like two mocks because I really didn't put a lot of time into it this time. And both of those I picked running back first, and I had a horrible draft. And this time, because he signed his big contract right before we started, which is why we wait till the last possible moment, uh, I picked receiver first. And after that, pieces just fell into place. And it was it was uh, a wealth of running backs this year in the league that are all very close in score possible mm-hmm. score so yeah. it was uh it it was an important year to take a receiver first now i'm looking at it in hindsight and uh but you got a d grade i think b minus thank you very much oh I that's right you did get a b minus nicole got a d uh style oh, got an a plus ahead of me. i knew you and style finished at the top yeah well, well the, the i did take his quarterback grades. yeah I think I surprised the league. That was rude. <laughs> the, the The round before it, I thought he was going to do it, and yeah. when he when he didn't, I'm like, oh, he, he's complacent this year, and he's the one that knocked me out of the playoffs last <laughs> year. And I picked right before him, so when I picked Taylor uh, Hurts, nothing wrong I, with spite. It, it, it was not. He types fast. It was not long before that message came through. <laughs> Dog it. All right, all right. Well, we'll see y'all next time. For all right, we had we had to end on a laugh. Fun. Sorry, I'm sorry if we rambled at the end, but we had to end on a laugh. Yeah.